Okay. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you guys for stopping by. A couple of things to talk about. Going to be kind of circling back with some of these stories that I previously covered on the channel with Ethan Crumley, his parents. Um, Ethan Crumley, let's see, one of the videos is from December 13, I believe. And then another one is more recent, I think from a couple days ago, two days ago or something, where we see his parents, man. So, yo, good afternoon. Thanks for the people that came by last night. I appreciate that. Let me do a quick sound check. Um, yeah, boom, good. Uh, last night was fun, and I kind of needed that. And Comcast did what Comcast does, but we lasted uh, three hours, so went pretty good. Kind of crazy. Some of the stories we covered, and uh, let me see if I can pull up the chat. What's up? What's up? I'm sweating, man. Went to go for, to exercise, took my pre-workout. Now I'm drinking something hot, and so I'm like having this weird whatever it is. <laughs> um, and we're gonna talk about this pr plane crash as well. That uh, let's see, somebody told me about this last night on Discord. Uh, who was it? Oh, Hawk M2C. Thank you for letting me know. I was gonna talk about it, but then everything crashed, or the internet crashed. So we're going to talk a little bit about that plane crash as well. I'm also going to talk about Aaliyah a little bit and her plane crash, if anybody remembers that. It kind of made me think about her plane crash a little bit. And it also reminded me that I think it was a couple months back I looked up Aaliyah. I don't even know why, but I saw that there was a recent story about her talking about the plane crash and what happened and supposedly what they did to her and that she didn't want to go on the plane and all that stuff. So we're going to talk a little bit about Aaliyah too. Um, and actually back in the day, I bought one of her albums. I forgot which one it was the one with the flower or something. Don't judge me. The pink album <laughs> with the flower, um, which was, you know, thing too, real quick before we get started, something new that I noticed that I guess YouTube is doing this. I guess this is new. So, okay. They age restricted it. Right. But they also put this thing. Okay. The following content may contain self-harm topics, blah, blah, blah. And then they put a phone number because one of the stories that we covered was that guy that I think killed like his ex-girlfriend and then goes to his wife's or ex-wife, I think his wife or ex-wife's house. And he's like Facebook live streaming and he's telling people, Hey, yeah, I killed my ex. Now I'm going to kill her. You know, it's custody stuff, blah, blah, blah. And he goes inside and then he kills himself. And so they put this thing here, which I thought was really dope. I've never seen this before. First time I've seen this. They put the phone number and the chat option. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and thank you for the mods for coming through right now. I appreciate that. Hey, uh, hey Shiloh, Melissa, Amy, Lexa, Judy, my melody, Amy, Bambi, Lindsay. I appreciate the people that are listening in from work uh, on Discord. Somebody told me this morning as well. Hey, I'm doing too much here. Let's see. Oh yeah, Duende. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Uh, I have, I have had, I've had a couple of people tell me, like on um, Discord or Twitter or email, they're like, "Oh, thank you so much, man." Sometimes when I'm at work, I listen to you. It gets me through my day. So appreciate that. So we're gonna start off with this uh, video here, and this is Ethan Crumley. I haven't seen this stuff because I've been busy doing the other stories. I was doing Oakley Carlson, which, by the way, if you haven't checked it out, you should definitely check that out. I think I've done like three videos, kind of in-depth, short, detailed, good content. Um, and I spoke to some people related to that situation. And so, and I'll be still following that story. So this is 15-year-old Ethan Crumley, all right? And his mother, uh, father, James Crumley, 45, Jennifer Crumley, 43, Ethan's 15, and the teen sophomore at high school is facing 24 charges Dang! with the mass shooting on November 30th, one count of terrorism causing death, four counts of first degree murder, seven counts of assault and the list goes on and on. Let's check this out together. It looks like I'm still 
Okay. Calling the case of People v. Ethan Crumley, 2-1-6-6-1-1. Your appearances, please. Mr. Keese? Thank you, Mark Keese. Thank you, Judge. Mark Keese, and we have people. Thank you, Ms. Collins. And your good afternoon, Your Honor. Assistant Prosecutor Kelly Collins appearing on behalf of people as well. And Ms. Lofton. Yes, good afternoon, Your Honor. Paula Michelle Lofton on behalf of Mr. Crumley. Your Honor, we also have Amy Hopp, who has been appointed second chair. And we also have Deborah McKelvey, who has been appointed to act as Mr. Crumley's guardian ad litem. Thank you. And with that, Ms. Hopp, if you just want to state your full name, and then we'll give Ms. McKelvey a chance to do that as well. Amy Hopp appearing on behalf of Ethan Crumley. Thank you. And Ms. McKelvey. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Deborah H. McKelvey, court appointed guardian ad litem on behalf of Ethan Crumley. Thank you. And Mr. Crumley, could you state your full name for us, please? Ethan Robert Crumley. Thank you, Mr. Crumley. So that's him right there, Ethan Crumley. Crumley. If at any time you cannot hear or understand myself or any of the parties to the proceeding, will you please let the court know? Yes, ma'am. And we are proceeding remotely instead of in person at the courthouse. Mr. Keese, is that with your consent? It is, Judge. Thank you. And Ms. Lofton. Yes, Your Honor. I did discuss that with Mr. Crumley. We are okay today to proceed by Zoom. Thank you. So as the attorneys have already mentioned, Ms. McKelvey has been appointed by the court this past Friday. The request was made by the defense and was agreed to by the prosecution. And the court finds that it is in the defendant's best interest for that appointment. The guardian ad litem duties and authorities are set forth in a court order that is contained in the court's file. There was also a stipulated order for discovery, or protective order, I should say, that was entered into on Friday. I did just receive another copy with the original signature of yourself, Mr. Keese. It was attached to the front of the file when I walked in. Does that mean you want me to re-sign the order and re-date it for today's date, or was that just for the court's file? Judge, that's just for the court's file. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So, and I do want to thank all the attorneys for working together on this matter. I really appreciate it. That's evidenced by the protective order that I'm sure took some time to agree upon. So I appreciate your continued... Uh-oh. I thought it was the internet again for a second. Things got quiet. What happened? That was weird. Agreed to. The, I really, it's by the protective order agreed upon. So I appreciate your continued cooperation with one another in the court to make sure that the interests of justice are served. So thank you again. And I know that discovery is coming in and it's being provided to Ms. Lofton and Ms. Hopp. What's the status of that? Thank you, Judge. We were able to get approximately 500 pages of reports and witness statements to counsel on Friday after the protective order was agreed to and submitted to this court. We do have a number of items outstanding. As this court can imagine, this was an extremely unique circumstance. There are a number of witness interviews being commenced. For one reason in particular, Judge, is that a number of these children who were at the school were victimized and traumatized themselves. That naturally has caused some delay in those interviews commencing, Judge. Just this morning, the prosecutor's office did receive from the sheriff's office a flash drive with over 340 items. That includes in-car video. It includes recorded witness interviews, witness statements, all things that we will turn over to defense. But as this court indicated, discovery is ongoing and the reports are continuing to come in. So this is, by the nature of the case and the scope of the investigation, this is going to take a little bit of time, Judge. Thank you. 
Uh, so with that, Ms. Lofton, I'm assuming you're requesting an adjourned probable cause conference date, or both parties are, I would assume. That is correct, Your Honor. I want to make sure that we are able to view all of the discovery before we form a decision about whether or not we will be holding a preliminary examination. So I am asking that already scheduled date be adjourned until after the new year. Thank you. And if we do schedule it on January 7th at 9 in the morning, will that give uh, you and Ms. Hopp enough time uh, to uh, properly make that decision? I believe so. If for some reason uh, there is an even longer delay in receiving the discovery, Mr. Keast and I can contact the court. That sounds Certainly. good. Have you discussed with your client the waiver of the statutory time period? Yeah, Your Honor. Uh, my client understands that he has a right to put your examination within 21 days. Because of the extreme volume of discovery, my client is fine with having the exam set outside of that 21-day period so we can all be on the same page and so that he can review all of the discovery in this case. Thank you. Mr. Crumley, did you hear and understand what your attorney just stated? Yes, ma'am. And are you in agreement with that? Yes. So you're not waiving, of course, your right to a preliminary exam, just the right to have it heard within the statutory time period. And that is, of course, so your attorney can properly prepare for a preliminary exam if one is necessary. Again, do you understand and agree to that? Yes, ma'am. I do find good cause to waive that statutory time. Good question. Laughing beside you says, is there a lawsuit against the school? I'm going to look up the articles. I did see something previously, but there was something going on. So I'm going to pull it up so we can read it after. Emma, thank you for the super chat. Appreciate it. Oh, and if you guys could hit like, por favor, it really helps out with the stream. Thank you. Time period, I will adjourn the probable cause conference uh, to uh, January 7th at 9 a.m. Um, and I guess I would ask if uh, this should be done remotely or not, just like today. Does that make sense under the circumstances? Your Honor, at this point, we can set it for a remote hearing. Um, if in between now and that date, Mr. Keeston, I decide it would be better to be in person based on what will be actually taking place on that day, we can definitely buy support. Absolutely, because of course, either of you can make that request, and if, you, if either the prosecution or defense would require uh, that, then it will be in person. So we'll initially set it remote, and we'll go from there. Um, That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McKelvey. Do you have uh, Have you had a chance to meet with Mr. Crumley? Were there any uh, anything that you wanted to indicate? Um, Your Honor, I did have an opportunity to meet with him on Friday afternoon. Uh, uh, at this point, we're able to interact, you know, through the normal process on the screen. Um, Your Honor, I don't know whether this is the appropriate time or you would prefer a motion. I do have concerns uh, that. Uh, his confinement at the Oakland County Jail and pursuant to uh, MCL 764.27a. Um, I'm not sure that he is uh, fully away from um, the sounds uh, of, of the adult inmates. Um, and pursuant to the court rule, uh, Basically, um, 6.909, um, there really has to be an assessment that is either a considered a menace to other juveniles or um, may not otherwise be safely detained in a juvenile facility. I, I understand the severity of what occurred. I, I think everybody does, including Mr. Crumley. But I, I, I don't know that simply you know, indicating that, that because the victims were of his age that he would necessarily be a menace. So I do have concerns for him and his, his mental and emotional well-being. Um, he currently is not able to benefit fully by what every other inmate at jail can. Uh, some has been due to a watch, but it is just very difficult. Uh, and the court knows the jail isn't conducive. It's not designed for juveniles. So, um, I, and so I would just like some direction. Do you want a written motion and I can lay everything out? I, I just feel that it, if I have to look out for what is best interest, it, it's not being at the jail. I believe his needs can be met at, at the village. Um, at least he will have greater human contact. He will have more uh, services available to him to help him through this. 
Um, and and I, I just feel that it, it is truly in, in his best interest, and I don't know that he really meets the, the standard of the court rule and the statute. And um, and I know that you know his his charge is not unique in the sense that there have been other children housed oh, in the village uh, with these type of offenses and being charged as an adult. I just feel that he's and, and uh, you know I, I'm not being humorous when I say this, but he could still at least be in school. I mean there are things he is still 15 years of age, and, and there are certain things, many things he's not going to get in jail. And, and so I'm, I'm imploring you on behalf of him and what's in his best interest that we allow him to go back to the village. I'm not aware of the brief time that he was there he caused any difficulty. I just think for his age, his, his mental, physical, emotional well-being, uh, housing him at the village uh, would serve him more than where he currently is. I know from what he told me on Friday, he hears adults in the cells next door to him. Uh, pursuant to the statute, he's not supposed to, and and, um, and I, I'm of the belief that they are adults, that they are not other juveniles. Thank you. Your Honor, I, I can speak to that as well and, um, before Mr. Keast has an opportunity to respond, Your Honor. Sure. Um, I watched the arraignment, and I understand that Mr. Keast made the argument at that time pursuant to MCR 6.909. Um, and after reviewing that statute, Your Honor, I, I honestly do not believe that my client should be considered a menace to other juveniles. This is someone who has never been in trouble before. This is not someone who has a history of assaulting kids his age uh, or any other negative contact with his peers. This, this one isolated incident is all that we're looking at here today. Um, and also, I'd like to speak to the fact that there are other juveniles housed at Children's Village charged with murder. This would not be the first time. There's others there now. So I definitely believe uh, that society is protected, as well as the other juveniles at Children's Village, if he was to be returned to Children's Village. And again, I also spoke with my client and agreed with Ms. McKelvey. He's being housed in the clinic. The clinic is still being used for adults that have medical ailments and medical issues. So there are adult inmates that are housed around him. And if you look at the specific language of the statute, I believe that we are violating that statute. Mm. Thank you. Mr. Keys? Thank you, Judge. Judge, this cannot be compared to any other case that this court or any court in this county has seen before. And calling this an isolated incident, quite frankly, does not do it justice. This was a mass murder at a school, Judge. This was planned. It was premeditated. The evidence that we have that we discussed at the arraignment showed it was premeditated for a period of time before it was commenced. The defendant didn't just attack other individuals. He targeted juveniles. This defendant fits MCR 6.909 to the T. This court has already made a ruling that the presumption is great that the juvenile committed the offense and the juveniles charged with first degree murder. This court already made the ruling that this court could move the defendant from Children Village to the Oakland County Jail. I have spoken with Captain Thomas Bida of the Oakland County Jail. He has provided me with watch sheets. This defendant is monitored every 15 minutes. His food intake is monitored. His weight is monitored. He has access to mental health care treaty shoots. He has access to medical care treaty shoots. If counsel is prepared to put such facts on the record regarding the Oakland County Jail's inability to house this defendant, I would ask for a written motion, and I would also ask this court to review in camera the Oxford High School video that does in fact prove beyond any doubt that this defendant is the individual who, per who perpetrated this offense on other children, Judge. Children's Village is not a secure facility. They have had escapes in the past, in the recent past. I can't imagine a situation where we could put this defendant in a school environment after what he did on November the 30th, Judge. So if we are going to readdress this ruling from this honorable court, I would ask it be by written motion. I would ask the opportunity for this court to review certain items in camera. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the court rule that is being addressed is uh, MCR 6.909, which is the place of confinement for the juveniles and allows the court uh, for a juvenile confined in a jail or similar facility designed and used to incarcerate adult prisoners upon a showing 
that the juvenile's habits or conduct are considered a menace to other juveniles. Um, while I, I did make a ruling prior, I still feel strongly about that, that his um, conduct could be a menace to other juveniles. I think his placement is appropriate uh, at, in the adult facility, specifically the Oakland County Jail. And uh, he, of course, shall be confined uh, and meet the uh, statutory um, guidelines when a juvenile is in that facility. So the only thing I'm hearing right now that is that may potentially be a violation is that he can hear other inmates who are um, who are adults. Is that correct, Ms. McKelvey? Uh, yes, Your Honor. That's that's my understanding. Okay. That means I will speak. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I did not mean to interrupt, Judge. I will speak personally with administration at the Oakland County Jail as soon as we end this call and I will make sure that the defendant is neither within sight nor sound of any adult at the jail. Thank you. We d obviously, we need to be compliant with the statutes and if that is, a cons it is a obviously a concern and thank you for addressing that. Anything further? Thank you. Uh, no, Judge, I will speak with counsel and we'll make sure that discovery gets to counsel as soon as it is available. Thank you. Nothing further from the defense, Your Honor. Thank you. You may all disconnect. We'll see you back on the cell. Thank you. Okay. Let me see something here real quick. He's someone who has never been in trouble before. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this was the cut, chopped up version, which is a little bit shorter, yeah. easier, I guess. Um, there's like a 24 minute one, but there's a lot of dead space on a 24 minute one version of that. Now, okay, a couple of things. So see, this was recent as well. Let's watch this video and then we're going to talk about these are the parents. This was posted December 14, two days ago. So, yeah, we're going to watch this one. These are Ethan uh, Crumley's parents. I'm putting together some of the information about the lawsuit stuff so we can kind of go over it. And I saw the link that uh, BL posted in the links area a while back. I miss a lot of those things. I just, I get, you wouldn't, I get a ton of notifications. So sometimes if people can DM it to me, even though I get a lot of that too. <laughs> uh, but, but like this morning, for example, I kind of sat there and I browsed through some of the things. So I'm trying to check it uh, daily, but I, I just get a bunch of stuff. Um, and this lawsuit thing has some kind of drama too, because I was kind of briefly reading over it when we were watching this video. And the original video, the one that BL was talking about, it's like 40 something minutes. I don't think that we have time to watch all that. And so I could still cover everything that I have planned to cover. Um, I mean, maybe for a separate video or something, but we can read some of the highlights in the article, but this is the attorney that's supposed to be uh, suing the school. And there's some drama about that because he put somebody on that lawsuit that hasn't even worked at the school for over a year. And so there's like some going back and forth. So we're going to get into that. I'm going to collect that. And then we'll talk about that after it. And there's been all kinds of other things too. We're going to talk, go into this little bit, the business owner that uh, saved one of the students. We'll look at that real briefly. And a more recent story, mixing some Florida stories, school threats. I don't know what's up with all the kids now. I don't know. They get, I guess they get encouraged to do this. Like they, they all start, one person starts doing it and then they all start doing these school threats. And I've been hearing that in various places that's been happening with schools. Let's check this out. Is Ethan really six feet tall? Sir, you can have a seat.
Okay, calling uh, docket number 2100-6652, People v. Jennifer Crumbly, and docket number 2100-6651, People v. James Crumbly. Please put appearances on the record, starting with the prosecuting attorney. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Karen McDonald, appearing on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Markeisha Washington, appearing on behalf of Thank you all for coming, everybody. Good afternoon, Your Honor. I'm Shannon Smith on behalf of both Jennifer and James Crumbly. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Marielle Blayman on behalf of Jennifer and James Crumbly. Okay, today is the date and time set for a probable cause conference. Before we begin the probable cause conference, I also I just want to place on the record again and advise both defendants. Um, do you understand that um, you do have the right to retain your own individual counsel, and since you are co-defendants in this case, um, if a conflict exists and or arises, um, you may want to have your own independent counsel. Do you understand that, Ms. Crumbly? Yes, Your Honor. Do you understand that, Mr. Crumbly? Yes, Your Honor. Attorneys, um, can you advise the court and tell the court whether or not you believe a conflict exists as it relates to your representation of these defendants at the same time? Your Honor, we have gone over this extensively within our office and with our clients. At this time, there is not a conflict. We have addressed if a potential conflict, how that could arise. Uh, we don't anticipate that's going to happen. We have actually ac executed a written waiver of any potential conflict with our clients. We have gone over it over and over, repeatedly. Okay, and you both understand it's your obligation to advise the court at any point in time during the course of these proceedings, including not just the preliminary examination, but up in the circuit court, if it goes to that point, of any conflict at the point that you recognize that one exists. Do you understand that? We absolutely do. Thank you. We okay, do, and, know, and knowing all that, I do want, I'm sorry, go ahead, Maureen. I said we do, Your Honor. Okay. Um, Ms. Crumbly, and knowing all that, do you still want to proceed today with these attorneys? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Crumbly, do you want to still proceed today with these attorneys? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right, let's go ahead. And uh, as far as the probable cause conference is concerned, um, go ahead. Do you have any resolution on this case? May I remove my mask to speak, Your Honor? Go ahead. I'm Karen McDonald on behalf of the people. Your Honor, uh, as you are no doubt aware, on November 30th, 20, 2021, in Oxford High School, Four children were murdered, six children and one teacher were shot. Hundreds of others were terrorized. Approximately 300 officers responded to the area, including representatives from at least 26 agencies, at least 11 fire departments responded. The volume of discovery in this case is staggering. It includes a tremendous number of police reports, digital evidence, photographs, search warrant returns, ATF reports, FBI reports, witness statements, and recorded interviews. This case is unprecedented in Oakland County, and perhaps the state. It is unlike any other case, and given that, we submit that the typical protocols for discovery and the normal time frames for a preliminary examination will not allow adequate time for the prosecution, or the defense for that matter, to adequately prepare. The parties signed and submitted a stipulated protective order regarding discovery for the court's signature. I will note for the record that the people and our position is that we that those sensitive digital and video material that indicate the actual uh, shooting and injuries will not be released and can be viewed um, at our office and defense counsel agrees we've also put in place a protective order for all the rest of the uh, evidence and documents so that it's not leaked on behalf of the, the victims in this case once counsel agreed to do that we tendered approximately 500 pages of discovery which I'm told they were um, in possession of late afternoon, yesterday. That was simply the first wave of data that we have, Your Honor. We've received another 40 gigabytes of data consisting of additional reports, recordings of witness interviews, surveillance videos, and witness statements, all of which must be reviewed and tendered. So we do not have all of the discovery. We, we approximate, we, we probably have a third of it. As, as you know, there are a lot of um, witnesses to interview and that, that is ongoing. The Oakland County, Oakland County Sheriff's Office has been working around the clock to provide us with digital evidence obtained from electronic devices seized during this investigation. That evidence will be voluminous as well and we don't have it in our possession. Um, our detective um, here, the officer in charge can tell you he's worked around the clock and most of his agency has as well as, well as other agencies. As a result, we're asking this court to find good cause 
to wait 20, the 21 days and adjourn the probable cause conference until after the new year to allow the parties to receive and review these statements. We anticipate being ready to present um, the preliminary exam uh, in February, Your Honor. And lastly, as the court knows, these children's and family, these funerals have just recently concluded. The prosecutor's office has a lot of work to do with a lot of the, the victims and the families. And we do not think it's in their best interest or the, in the interest of justice to do that during the holiday season. Um, there are several witnesses to prepare, and we want to make sure that we're, we are prepared to go forward on the date and time set for the preliminary examination. We anticipate that it will be 15 to 20 witnesses and that it will take three to five days. Anything on behalf of the defense attorneys relative to the request, uh, number one, for the request for the adjournment for the preliminary examination, as well as number two, any re, uh, you want to place the stipulation on the record as it relates to the requested protective order? Uh, good afternoon, Your Honor. The defense does acknowledge receipt of the discovery that the prosecutor described. We are not objecting to the adjournment. In fact, we're joining in the request for the adjournment. And we did um, review and sign the, the protective order. We don't have any objection to the protective order. Um, so I do have a, a copy of a protective order that was provided to the court on December 13th at about 11.30 a.m. Um, for each case based upon the stipulations that were placed upon the record by both attorneys. Um, I will go ahead and sign that protective order for both cases. As far as the request for the adjournment is concerned, can I have uh, both the defense attorneys and the prosecutor approach the bench? I thought it was crying for a second too. with all counsel at the bench relative to um, the preliminary examination, which by the way is currently scheduled for the 22nd of December. Um, there has been a request for an adjournment. Both parties are stipulating or have agreed to that request. I do need to place the waiver on the record. Um, Ms. Crum Mr. Crumbley, is he ready? Yes, Mr. Crumbley, do you understand that you do have a right to a preliminary examination within 14 to 21 days of the date of the arraignment? And that if I grant the request for the adjournment of the preliminary examination, you will not have it during that period of time. Do you understand that? Yes, I do, Your Honor. And are you willing to waive that right at this time? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Okay. And Ms. Crumbley, do you also understand that you do have a right to a preliminary examination within 14 to 21 days of the date of the arraignment? And that if I grant the request for the adjournment, you will not have your preliminary examination within that period of time. Do you understand that right? Yes, sir. And are you willing to waive that right? Yes, sir. Okay. 
The court will go ahead and reset the preliminary examination for February 8th at 1.15. At this time, I am, uh, that's the only date I'm giving you. If it appears that we need additional days, then we'll deal with that on the 8th um, based upon the availability of the court's calendar. Um, please uh, make sure that you are all prepared to proceed to exam on that date and time with appropriate exhibits. Um, if you want to have exhibits marked ahead of time, all you need to do is contact my court recorder and that can, um, you can have that accomplished. Okay, any argument on Ben? Your Honor, not at this time. Um, however, the defense will likely be filing a motion regarding Ben. You're going to file a motion regarding Ben? Yes. Okay. Um, well, file that motion and then is that something you want the court to address on the 8th? Um, Your Honor, is there a possibility of getting a motion date before the 8th? Are you doing one for sure? Yes. Are you definitely yeah, filing I, a written we motion? We just need to get a little bit more of the discovery, but yes. When do you anticipate that you'll be filing that? Um, it depends when we get some discovery, hopefully within a week. I'm going to get to some of the questions after this clip, pulled up some things. Hey Kays, hey Serafina, laughing beside you. Hey everybody, welcome. Thanks for coming by. I appreciate it. Afternoon stream. January 7th at 115. Um, if you uh, file the motion, make sure you comply with the Michigan court rules in terms of filing the motion and providing the judge's copy. If there's a response, then the prosecutor must also comply with the court rules in terms of filing the response. Okay, anything else? No, thank you, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Okay, we're adjourned. Hey, he's not wearing his mask. So, all right, let's get to some a couple things. A couple things. I saw somebody in the chat asking about the protective order. According to NPR.org, it says here that uh, Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald asked the judge to delay the hearing. McDonald said the case had generated so much evidence the prosecutors have had haven't had sufficient time to work through it all and share it with defense lawyers representing Crumley, the Crumleys. The volume of discovery is staggering, which she just said. McDonald said, adding, it, was un, it wasn't like any case her office has ever handled. The evidence, which included includes witness testimony, surveillance videos, and digital evidence from the suspect's electronic devices, will remain under protective order, meaning it will not be released to the public. So that's, uh, that's the explanation there, according to NPR. And I saw BL and some other people talking about the the straw purchase law. Basically what it says here from ATF.gov, a straw purchase is an illegal firearm purchase where the actual buyer of the gun being unable to pass the required federal background check or desiring to have his or her name associated with the transaction uses another person who can pass the required background check to purchase the firearm for him slash her. 
Now, uh, let me read to you this other article here. Just scroll down to this will, this will cover some of the questions people were talking about. Okay, that's what I wanted to get to. Did Ethan Crumley's parents know he had a gun? Ethan Crumley's parents bought him a gun, practiced shooting it with him, and had warning signs he was considering violence, according to the timeline laid out by officials Wednesday. The 15-year-old was was present on November 26th when his father purchased the 9mm 6R used in the shooting, and even though his dad made the purchase, it was clear the gun was bound for Ethan Crumley's personal use. Just got my new beauty today. You guys might remember, I, I showed that picture. A lot of this stuff we've kind of already covered on the previous live streams. But uh, there was a picture, I think it was an Instagram post, and you can see that caption. Ethan posted on a now-deleted social media uh, that same day, according to officials. The following day, he, he and his mother headed to a shooting range to practice with a weapon, with Jennifer describing the outing as a mom and Sunday testing out his new Christmas present, which, you know, we saw that as well. Uh, did Ethan Crumley's parents warn school officials he was armed? So I saw somebody in the chat ask that as well. According to the independent NPR, well, no, this is independent. It says neither Jennifer nor James Crumley alerted school officials that Ethan had easy access to a semi-automatic handgun, according to prosecutors. Even once they had been warned, he was showing interest in seeking ammunition at school and making violent drawings, which I, I thought I read somewhere he dismissed it as art or something else gaming or something i don't know uh did ethan crumley's parents have any warnings he was considering violence school officials tried on multiple occasions to warn crumley's parents that their son was allegedly considering violence at school which to me that still looks bad upon the school of course it looks bad on the parents but it's like hello <laughs> you just let him keep going in the days before the shooting oxford high school left both a voicemail and an email with the family that a teacher had spied i was gonna say spied Yeah, had spied Ethan searching for information about ammunition online, which was met with no response to officials. Jennifer, however, did allegedly text Ethan, writing, LOL, I'm not mad at you. Uh, you have to learn not to get caught, which that's all the stuff we've kind of covered already. Things escalated on November 30th, the school, the morning of the school shooting, which officials called both parents into school after finding an alarming drawing of Ethan's that featured pictures of guns, laughing emojis and messages like my life is useless and thoughts that won't stop help me school personnel showed the parents the drawing advising them to put ethan in counseling immediately james and jennifer crumley resisted the idea that their son leaving this sorry james and jennifer resisted the idea of their son leaving the high school at the time instead jennifer and james left high school without their son miss mcdonald the prosecutor said on friday once the once there were reports that a school shooting had occurred at the school that day, Jennifer allegedly sent a text to Ethan that read, Ethan, don't do it, while James drove straight home and reported his gun missing. So, and this is other stuff too. I never really got deep into this, but I did see this. Supposedly, Jennifer, this 43 real estate broker, wrote an open letter to then President Donald Trump, November 16, about guns uh, as a female. As a female and a realtor, thank you for allowing my right to bear arms. She will allow me to be protected if I show a home to someone with bad intentions. Thank you for respecting the amendment, that amendment. James, who has worked in technology salesman, as a technology salesman, wrote on his Facebook page that the, the post was spot on. So um, most of this stuff, you know, we've covered already, but it's just like a nice little recap. The straw thing I didn't cover before. I don't know how that's going to work in this case. I guess it's going to have to work out through the trial. But everything does indicate, you know, that they bought this gun for him. Uh, oh, okay, a couple things. Let's do this. Let's do this too, to kind of briefly cover. Uh, if you guys want, one day we can watch the the whole hearing with the attorney, like the hit where he the lawsuit thing. But that's like forty minutes, 
and I didn't plan for an extra 40 minutes on top of everything else I wanted to kind of talk to you guys about. So maybe next time we can do that if you want. Okay, so this uh, lawsuit situation, which we're going to just talk about briefly, there's, a, there's two $100 million lawsuits that have been filed against the Oxford School District and several employees after the deadly shooting last week. Thank the whole thing. Coming. Yeah, that's the whole thing. You can't watch that. The lawsuits were filed in federal court in Detroit by Jeffrey and Brandy, France, on behalf of their daughters, Riley, a 17-year-old senior who was shot in the neck, and her sister, Bella, a 14-year-old ninth grader who was next to her at the time, their attorney is Jeffrey Eager. Uh, on top of that, on top of the district, those in the lawsuit include the district superintendent, the Oxford High School principal, dean of students, two counselors, two teachers, and a staff member. So they did this press conference at 11 a.m. Thursday. Um, we know the details of when it happened, November 30th. The Franz family lives in Leonard, just northwest of Oxford. One of the lawsuits criticized school officials for not expelling, disciplining, and, and or searching Crumley prior to the shooting, which allowed Crumley to return to his classroom and carrying out the murderous rampage. The lawsuit also said that the school district knew or should have known that the policies, procedures, training, supervision, and discipline staff members named in the suit were inadequate for the task and each defendant was required to perform. That each defendant was required to perform. So this one goes a little bit into the drama. There's some drama going on, which to me is kind of like, all right, remove the guy that hasn't worked there for a year, but then continue. Uh, Jeffrey, the guy we're just talking about, was accused of wrongly naming ex-Oxford High School worker in lawsuit. District claims employee named in lawsuit hasn't worked at the high school in more than a year. Okay. Um, in a courtroom motion filed Tuesday, December 14, Oxford Community Schools claims former high school dean of students Ryan Moore should be dismissed from Figures' case. In a hurry to be on the news, Jeffrey filed a lawsuit against Oxford High School and numerous employees without conducting the due diligence required by our rules of professional responsibility, the motion says. While his pleading is full of lies and misrepresentations, one is particularly appalling and must be dealt with immediately. According to the motion, Figure named Moore as the high school current high school sorry, as the current high school dean of students, but Moore hasn't worked at the school for more than a year. The motion says Figure accused Moore of being aware that the shooter posed a threat to students, but did nothing. Figure is accused of alleging that Moore made students feel less safe with his actions. Had Mr. Figure been less concerned about being on the news and more concerned about the facts, he would be in he would have been able to easily confirm that Mr. Moore had not even worked in the high school for more than a year. At the risk of being redundant, Mr. Moore was not the high school dean of students. As alleged by Mr. Figure, he worked in an entirely different building. The motion goes to call Figure's legal filing sloppy and claims that Moore has received death threats. Damn, so they're coming for him. Death threats, as the internet does, right? It says that Oakland County Sheriff's Office is investigating more than a dozen new threats against the school's administrators in Oxford since the lawsuits were filed. So they're coming for everybody. The internet, the web sleuths. You know how they do. Uh, and if that's true, they, they really should remove this guy from the, at least from the lawsuit. Not that it, you know, takes away from all the crap that happened. But yeah, if he's not, if he wasn't there, then take him out. Moore had reinforced doors installed on his home, damn, and pulled his children out of school in order to protect his family, according to the motion. Ooh. Double downing. District officials said that they sent a letter to Figure after Moore was named in the lawsuit. In the letter, Figure was informed that Moore was no longer the dean of students and has not been employed there for more than a year. We said that like five times. The letter demanded a retraction and a public apology from Figure, according to the motion. In a response, Mr. Figure refused to fix the problem he created. The motion says, in fact, he double downed. Figure filed a motion accusing Moore of destroying evidence, alleging that Moore had made his LinkedIn account private, district officials say or said. The motion claims Moore, someone who should have not been sued in the first place, made the account private. Yeah, the motion says 
more someone who have not been should have not been sued in the first place made the account private to prevent physical harm from his from himself and his family which that makes sense the court needs to stop this misconduct before it gets worse the motion says the court needs to stop it before someone is physically injured or killed because of mr figure's reckless and false statements damn i almost kind of want to see the video now i almost kind of want to see it but it's 40 minutes long um, I mean, maybe we can do it. Maybe we can do it. We can probably do it. Uh, you guys, I'll, I'm going to put a vote. I wanted to show you another clip with, with regards to this, but maybe I'll put a vote. You guys can tell me. I mean, I haven't watched the video, so I don't know if it's informative or it's just one of those things where it drags out. Um, cause it's like four minutes long. so I'll do a little poll and I'll, uh, I'll show you this other clip that I wanted to show you. Oh Lord. The computer's acting up here. Let me refresh that. In the meantime, let me show you this while I figure out the mess. Okay. You guys have probably seen this. Almost, I don't want TMZ to try to claim this. <laughs> Let me uh, fix this poll thing. This was uh, Ethan at a previous job or something. You guys want to see it? Okay. Okay. Watch the attorney. Speak. <laughs> yes, please distract me from my job. All right, maybe we'll do it then. Create a poll. Let me see. Watch. Journey. Speak. There we go. Ask your community. Sorry about the first poll. My computer was doing all this weird freezing stuff. Um. All right. So yeah, let's check this out. This was like at a job or something. I don't know what was going on with this dude. I saw this a while back, but I just I haven't really covered Ethan since. Cause I've been doing all this other stuff. But I guess he's like walking, or I don't know what kind of issue. I don't know if he's on something or he's just. Maybe he has mental problems, off balance. I don't know. But it falls pretty hard. You guys seen this? I don't know what do you think about it? You guys want to see it? Okay, we got 88%. Let's get some more votes in. I don't know. That was weird. I don't know what the, what that dude was. Some of you guys haven't seen that. I could fast forward too. Yeah. Okay. I think we're gonna watch it. Oh, there's audio. <laughs> oh, 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 you all right? Yeah, I'm not Here, you all right? Yeah. All right. We're gonna watch it then. I'm going to use the clip that uh, BL sent. It's a lot to look through for all this stuff to even find it. Let's see if I can find it. Here it goes. Uh, this is it right here. Okay. I'm live nation. So okay. my wife got me this weird new tool for Christmas. Investigation except holes and a dozen other. All right, so yeah, this is from Live Nation. We'll check this out. 
and the computer's all jacked up today. I don't know what's going on. All right. Welcome back here to live now from Fox. Well, two $100 million lawsuits have now been filed against Oxford High School officials. This uh, with claims that the school may have had some notification and email about the threats before that uh, tragedy did take place. We're going to go ahead, play out uh, this press conference announcing these charges for you right here on live now from Fox. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Everybody's ready? Okay. To my immediate left uh, uh, is Jeff and Brandy France, uh, F-R-A-N-Z. They are the parents of Riley and Bella, who were victims in the Oxford High School shooting. I'm going to uh, give you a statement that we've prepared. Um, I'll take questions after the parents will not be uh, speaking. Um, yeah, we don't know what he was, you know, if he was on something, medication, whatever, got, you know, we don't know. It is an interesting video, though. I mean, but yeah, we don't know. If you have any questions. And everything we just read with those articles kind of paints and gives us the context. So it kind of worked out good, I guess. It gives us the context. Now we're going to see what he said. For me, I'll be glad the parents. to answer uh, a limited, reasonable number of questions, and uh, then we'll go from there. More than 20 years ago, I appeared before cameras that uh, looked remarkably like those in this room in Denver, Colorado, after two students, Klebold and Harris, who looked remarkably like Ethan Crumbly, murdered my client's son, Isaiah Scholes, and a dozen other students and teachers, and wounded my client's son, Mark Taylor, and 21 others, all students and victims who looked remarkably like my clients today. In a high school, Columbine High School, that looked and looks remarkably like Oxford High School in Oxford, Michigan. Columbine at that time, 1999, 13 dead, 23 wounded. Oxford High School, four dead, seven wounded. And between 1999 and Columbine and 2021 at Ex Oxford High School, 304 fatal shootings in America's schools, 278,000 children trauma. I wasn't saying the attorney was on anything. We were talking about uh, the video we just saw where Ethan was falling. As a result, <laughs> this is nothing. I haven't seen nothing crazy yet. This is nothing. Of the shootings in their schools, 298 schools like Columbine and Oxford High School involved 20 years, 20 years, and nothing's changed. So we could talk today about the nearly 300 school shootings and the hundreds of children that have been murdered in classrooms since Columbine. I could talk today about the hundreds of thousands of children who are traumatized for life, like Bella, like Riley, sitting in classrooms afraid that at any moment someone might start shooting. We could talk about children who have to be trained to respond to mass shootings. Mm. Okay, I'm sorry guys. Let me just pause it for a second. Let me give you the context since a lot of people are wondering about this video where we just watched uh, Ethan fall. And so there's a TMZ article, but it was also posted by the Daily Mail. They first originally posted it and uh, it's, it's pretty brief. But uh, the video shows then 14-year-old Crumley in a diner where he worked back in September 2020. 
Crumley is walking in a work area and you see him disoriented and wobbly before he collapses, hitting his head on a cabinet. In the video first obtained by the Daily Mail, he struggles to get up before someone comes over and helps. The diner's owner says someone on the staff called his parents and sent them home. His mom blamed it on Ethan not eating that day, but the owner has his or has her doubts, saying she thinks it might have been related to his medications. So that's interesting. What medications was he on if he was on them? You know? There's also this. The diner owner claims Ethan's older brother, Eli, was caught smoking weed on the job. He also worked at the diner. And when someone on the staff threatened to call his parents, Eli allegedly responded, where do you think I got it from? Oof. That's interesting. So that is, I'll just briefly show you what I was reading, but that's just the, you know, just the daily mail. So there's the little bit of context behind that video, which, you know, we still don't know what's what, but it's interesting to have a little bit more information on that. Who are, need to be trained to know enough to barricade doors and to text one last message to their parents if they don't survive. We could talk about the lockdown locks that they installed at Oxford High School and they're very proud of. We could talk about the need for medical metal detectors in our schools. We could talk about the possibility of clear backpacks. We could talk about turning our schools into armed fortresses. We could talk about the need for legislation. We've been talking for over 20 years, for God's sake. Some of us are tired of talking. I know I am. So today, at least, I am going to do something on behalf of the parents and the children that I represent and that were victimized at Oxford High School. We're going to hold people responsible for betraying the trust we put in them to protect our children. We're going to hold every one of them responsible. The Oakland County prosecutor has done her job and she's extending the law to the parents who encouraged disturbed children and then put weapons of mass murder into their deranged son's hands. But that's not enough. I now am going to prosecute the rest of this case for everyone else. The prosecutor has her job and I have mine. It's not enough to make murderers like these people and their son responsible or complicit parents. It's not enough to make these complicit parents who put the guns into the hands of their son responsible. There's a responsibility that our society shares in protecting our children. There is a responsibility among teachers, counselors, and school administrators who could easily, easily have prevented and stopped the slaughter. We all have to look at what individual responsibility we may have. And now we have to do something about it. At Oxford High School, they'll search your backpack if they think you're vaping but they refused to suspend or search a student who wrote what we now know was reams of homicidal notes and drawings, scenes of classroom slaughter and mayhem. We know they refused to call authorities, that there was a police liaison available who could have been called in when they were well aware of Crumley's violent and murderous intent. When the disturbed parents refused to get help for their disturbed child, they did nothing. They failed to consider the safety of other students. And they allowed a deranged, 
homicidal student to return to class with a gun in his backpack with over 30 rounds of ammo in his backpack when they knew he was a homicidal threat. He had told them as much. He had written as much. He had drawn pictures of his plan and he was allowed to carry it out. Now I understand we can't change the perverted values of the Second Amendment society overnight. Values that prioritize gun ownership over the lives of our children. But we can make the cost of denying our own responsibility to stop this slaughter of our children so costly that maybe, just maybe, one less child will survive and not be murdered. So maybe, just maybe, children can be children again and live and learn in safe environments. We hope by this lawsuit to make the financial cost of allowing children to be slaughtered very high so as to compel people to do something if moral responsibility, and which it has for over 20 years, has proved insufficient to make them act. When the right to own a gun trumps the right to protect our children and to make them safe, you know in America we have misplaced our priorities. We have to love and protect our children first and foremost. And so by this lawsuit, it's time that we stop talking and start acting. These parents have chosen to act. And today we have done just that. Today we have filed a federal lawsuit, which I've provided to you, <clears throat> alleging that the counselors, the teachers, the school administrators who failed the students at Oxford High School at virtually every turn, therefore violated the civil rights of the Oxford High School students who were injured and killed during the slaughter. We have also prepared and are going to now amend the federal lawsuit that was filed be, before Judge Goldsmith to include state causes of action, which include both gross negligence and endangerment of children under the child protection laws of the state of Michigan. Now finally, and I'm not ignorant of this, having practiced in this state and others for many years, that the laws the, I guess the, the sordid truth, the, 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 the secret that, that is openly known among lawyers in this state is that our political officials talk about and give lip service to the safety of our children and then behind your back they make the laws such that parents such as the Francis can't do anything about it. They tie their hands and they make it virtually impossible for them to bring lawsuits to protect their children, to make it costly for wrongdoers to allow this to happen. That's the, uh, the unfortunate uh, secret that uh, many people in the state of Michigan aren't aware of, that their lawmakers behind their back talk one line and then behind their back in conjunction with insurance companies make it impossible for victims to sue. I understand we have a hard road to hold. I understand that this is not going to be easy. However, now is the time to do something about it. And if somebody out there wonders why, what do you stand to gain? Because the law doesn't allow us to prosecute and put any more people in jail. That's the prosecutor's job. The law only allows us one outlet, and that is to make it so costly that it hurts in the pocketbook so that they might not do it again. Now that might not be enough, that might be insufficient, that might be just absolutely, uh, if you will, spitting in the wind. But it's something, it's something. Somebody's got to start paying attention. 
And if not now, when? I'll be glad to answer any questions. Who is the they you're referring to? School officials? Uh, school at, get punitive on the community so that more people take notice? Or what? We're all involved. I don't think my statement made it any less clear that we all share blame for allowing these events to constantly occur. Um, I might add that the news media shares blame in this because Ooh. you talk about everything except the most obvious, which is the, the mechanism by which the slaughter occurred, which is the guns, because you've been cowed into submission and you believe that in America we're not no longer allowed to talk about the one thing every other society in the world would talk about is how in the world does a 15-year-old get armed to murder people in schools. You fail to talk about that, but we as a society fail to talk about it. We talk about everything else except the 10 million pound gorilla in the room, which is the guns. We talk about metal detectors. We talk about uh, clear backpacks. We talk about something that could have prevented this, obviously, bringing the police liaison officer into the uh, uh, room with uh, Crumley and not allowing him to go back to the classroom, but immediately removing him from the classroom. We talk about all these things, but we don't do anything. We sit there and let the prosecutor prosecute these deranged people who allowed their son to have guns and then took $4,000 and ran away. But they're not the only perpetrators here. We share responsibility. And the administrators, the counselors, the teachers at Oxford High School bear responsibility. I am certain that the Oakland County Sheriff's Department believes that had the administrators and counselors called in the police liaison who is there and who is available to them, that Ethan Crombley would not have been allowed to leave whatever room he was in, walk into a bathroom, arm himself, walk out, and shoot Riley, almost kill Bella, and kill four others, and wound eight others. I'm absolutely absolutely positive of it. And I think courts will agree. The only challenge we have is getting through the labyrinthian myriad of laws that have been set up by our politicians in this state to allow them to stand up in front of cameras and say how sad they are that these events occur. But unfortunately, the victims aren't going to be able to do anything because we've passed laws that make it impossible for them to sue or do anything. How ridiculous. Any other questions? Sir, uh, what kind of evidence do you have in terms of emails that precipitated the shoot? He's going off. Uh, he's pretty well spoken. I mean, I've never seen this guy. Somebody said he's like a prominent lawyer. Somebody said an actor, I guess. He's definitely good with speaking to the media. You know, well trained, speaks well, knows what the hell he's saying, knows how to trigger, which is probably what he wants to do anyway trigger to get the, you know, the attention and everything. And I don't know. It's interesting. This is a good link. Thanks, BL interesting especially with some of the context i don't know <laughs> it's kind of crazy to see we have the same evidence uh that uh that you have been privy to in terms of the prosecutor's release of information, our knowledge now that it isn't just one drawing or one writing, but is reams of drawing. But the prosecutor, you recall, has access to uh, mm. things that are permitted under her subpoena power. We now have subpoena power as of this morning. So we can now subpoena the same documents that the prosecutor could compel uh, the Oxford School District to turn over. I might add that the Oxford School District politely declined uh, Attorney General Nessel's uh, uh, offer to conduct an investigation. Well, unfortunately, the Oxford School District is not going to be able to decline my offer to conduct an investigation because my offer is not going to be a request, but it's going to be demand in the face in, in the form of subpoenas requiring them to turn over the documents so that we can lay out for you. Because remember, they've been a little coy with this. I realize, and I, I salute the prosecutor. She has uh, made some of the evidence available. Clearly, the Oxford High School uh, uh, 
administration, including the superintendent, has not been as transparent. And I believe that there is a lot more information there than uh, has been turned over, and I'll obtain that, and I will have no problem in pre presenting that evidence to the public. Um, I think one of the big things, I know it's been, it's been covered, but I think one of the big things in this case that could have prevented all of this tragedy would have been the, the involvement of the police liaison, which is what they're there for. Um, I have not heard a rational explanation uh, uh, from uh, the school administration yeah. as to why that was not utilized. Um, and as a result, by doing the things that they did or didn't do, they placed the students in much greater danger than they would have been had they done that. The students would have been protected, and that is basically the essence of the federal complaint here. The complaint here um, basically alleges in federal court something called state-created danger. The reason that we're in federal court, and let me tell you this, is because the state of Michigan is so hypocritical in the passage of laws that protect government that we have to go into federal court and have federal judges protect our children's civil rights because the state of Michigan has passed laws that protect murderers and people who assist murderers in killing our children. And so the primarily the access for relief is federal court. It isn't just we went into federal court or we decided to file a federal court action. The reason we filed a federal court action is because the state of Michigan and your elected officials who are telling you how sad they are about this slaughter, in fact, assist the passage of laws that make it impossible for the citizens to do anything. And so we have to go into federal court to seek relief under the United States Constitution and not the laws of the state of Michigan, because the laws of the state of Michigan are set up to protect guns and gun owners and people who allow children like Crumbly to commit murder and mayhem. Can you tell us a little bit about can you tell us a little bit about Bella and Riley? They're honor students. They're athletes. Bella's a star athlete. Riley was accepted to six colleges. This should have been a time in which they're preparing to go on Christmas vacation. They were leaving on December 25th. Instead, Riley's spending her time convalescing and packing a wound with a neck wound that less than 2% of ch people who suffer that wound survive. And Bella's been uh, literally uh, traumatized uh, as if she was surviving in a war zone. These are two ultimately beautiful children who now are going to have to go back to a school that they know was attacked and is a war zone. That, just that in and of itself is a travesty and a tragedy in America. What, what have we become? As Americans, what, why are, are, what, are, what have we become? Why would we allow this? Their backpacks are still strewn on the floor. The administration has got to collect all of their belongings. And at some point after the first of the year, the children will have to go back. And they'll remember and they'll know where one of their classmates or more of their classmates were murder, murdered or wounded, or where they were murdered or wounded. What, what does that say to us about America? The hypocrisy has to stop. And if anybody wants to know why I did it, if any cynical human being says, oh, it's for the money, ha, ha, how do you think get, things get done in this country? How do you think things get done? There's no, there's only one Oakland County prosecutor, and these folks in the murder are the only people who might go to jail for the rest of their lives. Nobody from that administration is going to go to jail. Nobody is going to be brought out before the bar of justice by the Oakland County prosecutor. It is only through the actions of these parents and others like them that something might get done in this regard. Something. And I don't hold a lot of hope because I keep telling you don't believe the lip service that the public officials are telling you behind the scene they're working and they pass laws to make it impossible for these parents and these children not only to get justice to be, be protected and that's what this lawsuits about How are you? 
Can I ask a quick question? Because you're talking about the family and appreciate them being here. We don't know what they're going through. We don't know what their daughters are going through. Can you tell us a bit more about what happened to Riley exactly and what her recovery is like? Briefly, I'll tell you that Riley and uh, um, Bella, along with uh, their friend who was murdered uh, and who was buried yesterday were in there we're in the bathroom they exited the bathroom and they were shot down like 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 they were in a war zone um, it happened like that um, and uh, since then their lives have been absolutely upended but that's obvious this is not unique to this situation this this, this is the horror that these these this family has to go through i mean look at they're they're thinking of a christmas vacation they're thinking of leaving on on christmas day they're thinking of uh of selecting uh riley's uh college out of six she's an honor student that she's been uh, admitted to and now they have to pack her wounds and they have to worry about being here because nobody's at home with her to watch the wound in her neck and make sure it's okay now thank God she's going to survive but again only 2% of children her age well, not just her age who suffered neck wounds such as her and she actually did the research on her own survived this type of injury so she is beyond lucky but there's four that will never as you know get go home and there'll be another visit tonight and another funeral tomorrow and something 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 has to be done about it something something and we're doing something we're taking action now we're not just talking about words and niceties okay any and other questions what's your take on this independent investigation i don't know what that means it sounds like hogwash to me mm. there's no so what's independent the prosecutor will conduct an investigation relating to the murders and the murderer's family the no one to my knowledge will do an investigation Investigation, except me or others of the uh, administrators and the people involved in the school district because they're not uh, they're not charged with a crime and unless they're under subpoena or under uh, their defendants in this lawsuit um, they don't have to respond nor will they and by the way just so you know okay behind the scenes in all of this also is they're being told what to do by their insurance company so you know it okay this isn't this is now another dirty little secret okay the reason that you're not hearing anything from the uh, superintendent of schools and the principal at Oxford High School is because they've lawyered up by insurance lawyers who tell them keep your your mouth shut keep your mouth shut why because they're worried not about an independent investigation to shine light on it because they don't believe that such a thing should happen they're worried about paying money that's all they care about they, now they care about money, the, the financial liability. They built a beautiful football stadium. They built a beautiful blue football field. Beautiful. I don't know how many millions of dollars. Believe me, they're worried about financial responsibility. Well, that's the way the society works. Everybody might be cynical about it, but unfortunately, that's all I can do. I can make it hurt, but I can't make it hurt by putting them in jail. I can make it hurt by making them pay. Anybody else? We talked about gun laws. What type of gun laws? What gun? Wow, what? It, it would just sane, rational laws that would require parents who buy guns to lock them up. Who I'm not suggesting that we can't own guns in this society. I'm suggesting that we have sane, rational laws that at least make it as hard to own a gun or to use a gun as it is to drive a motor vehicle. We require everyone in this state, my children, to go through vehicle auto training uh, in order to drive a, a, a vehicle. And then they have to go through certain years in which they're supervised until they're allowed to do something. We don't do that for guns. That's insane. We don't allow people to dr drink alcohol. We think that's not good. We allow people to do drugs whenever they want to do it. But guns who, who, who have done this to society, we allow it under some... Non these are this, these are the post. The reason I have this here, these two people are not only the facilitators of the murder, 
by giving their son a gun and then by not cooperating with the authorities and, and the people at uh, 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 Oxford High School to remove their son. They're the poster children for the Second Amendment gun nuts who think, yeah, give everybody guns. Do every She knew one of the, the mother apparently wrote uh, uh, Crumley and said, don't do it. Don't do what? Don't do what? Apparently. Yo, he is snapping. He is snapping. The one of people are pissed off. He's snapping. <laughs> he, he said gun nuts. I was like, oh, sure. Dude is snapping. No wonder people are getting triggered by this shit. <laughs> um, wow. I mean, it, it's, it is a really messed up situation. Like we were just talking about previously. I wonder what kind of meds was he allegedly on? You know, the, the Daily Mail article, which I took down, which I should have had up, went a little bit more into depth, a little bit more as far as kind of a little bit of the, the that situation where he fell uh and his brother ethan's brother eli worked there as well at that same place at that diner he was 18 at the time and it says here eli and ethan had the same father but different mothers originally from florida you know florida it's always florida the two boys later moved to oxford with their dad james crumley and his second wife ethan's mom jennifer the older brother hinted at some family turmoil that prompted him to abruptly move out in March 2020. He went to live with his biological mother in Florida, where he grew up. Oh, you can actually see a picture of them together. Let me show you this real quick. But yeah, the thing is, man, like, I mean, his kid's on meds. Maybe has issues. I mean, obviously has some issues, right? And then you're buying him a gun. You know what I'm saying? I'm not like anti-gun bro, but like you, you have responsibility, man. They, they're supposed to be serious. I guess it's like these days, there's no responsibility really. And I hear of a lot of stories too. These people not locking up their guns, which these people clearly, from what I've seen, you know, I don't know for a fact, from what I've seen, bought the gun for him as a present. Um, if he's having issues and all this kind of stuff, and, and, and even that day when they went to school, the sc allegedly the school's trying to say hey take him home and they're like nah we're good this is the brother here the older brother right there and so maybe he had some sort of sense to get the hell out of there he said it mostly had to do with their relationship with my stepmother and I Eli said Ethan remained living with his parents in, small, in a small home in Oxford less than two miles from where he opened fire um uh, And that was that. Interesting, man. Jacked up. Yeah, I mean, at some point, bro, I mean, it's got to be some sort of, you know what I'm saying? I mean, and I've covered a lot of stories, people not locking up their guns. That guy, Darius Swain, that was a case too, a local case in Florida, up north, where the parents or somebody, I don't know if it was the uncle, somebody just left the gun on top of the refrigerator. And I still don't know exactly all the details, but police believe it was self-inflicted. You know, I don't know. She knew he was going to do it. And these are the poster children for what's happening in our society. These folks. And I, and I do believe, too, that people are saying for sure there, there is a black market. There will always be a black market. Uh, and so people will probably be able to find ways to get a hold of it. But like when it comes to kids, man, I mean, you got to be responsible with this shit, right? Are the ones that are endangering all of us. They and I guess adults too, obviously. They're the ones that are out there screaming the loudest about taking away their gun rights. And look what it happens to the rest of us. So these people we've allowed to run our lives. Well, isn't that great? These are the folks who are doing it. As we continue to listen in to questions here after this lawsuit was announced, some of you are going to be seeing a two-minute break. Uh, important things and these people are less important to me now than the people that we've brought suit against. I'd like to go back to the first question I asked in, the, in this context because you're talking about suing this district which is in essence the taxpayers in the community. That's an interesting topic. I mean I, I, I see you guys talking about Big Pharma. I was talking, if you guys have missed it, the last two streams I kind of talked about doing an Adderall stream just the personal effects and for the people that have been on it since childhood which I, I want to do some research on it too 
to bring forward and then i just i'd love to take calls and that people can talk about that so something in the future we'll see no it's not it is not the taxpayers in the community is the people that make up that school district the taxpayers fund them but the taxpayers don't make up that district they do not those people are chosen privately they're hired privately there's a lot of things taxpayers fund but taxpayers are also funding insurance policies and insurance policies i promise you are covering all of those people just like any other enterprise that's why uh we have how many school districts in this state these things are money-making enterprises in case you don't know um these people are not doing this for the goodness of their heart. Um, school administrators uh, uh, make in Michigan hundreds of thousands of dollars in pay. They're some of the best paid executives. They're very sought after jobs in the state. Um, should the taxpayers exercise more control over this? function maybe but I, you don't see you know they go into the school board and they yell about uh some nonsensical things about uh, about teaching uh race theory or something that i don't understand but other than that i don't see the taxpayer wait what did he say <laughs> uh some nonsense you don't see it's more control over this um should the taxpayers exercise more control over this function maybe but I, you don't see you know they go into the school board and they yell about uh some nonsensical things about uh, about teaching uh race theory or something that i don't understand <laughs> but other than that i don't see the taxpayers filling up the uh, the uh, board of education meetings to make sure that uh, there's an investigation about what happened at oxford high school <laughs> i would like to see as much concern about yeah, I'm not interested in that particularly at all. <laughs> uh, uh, that is, there is about certain teaching theories in this country which don't make any sense to me. Forgive me, what I'm trying to get at, though, and I'm, <laughs> what? I'm not asking you clearly enough, is trying to exert influence or pressure in this fashion against school administrators. Yeah, I'm not even sure what he meant by that. Was he bashing it, or was he saying he's pro, He's like he's for it? I, I don't know. To try and generate awareness about an issue. I'm personally not interested in it, but uh, I'm, I, I wasn't sure what he was getting at, which kind of surprised me. You say it's not being addressed legislatively, except for which a lot of people agree with what you're saying. It, it, I'd like more from you in regard to the fact of my words, not yours, making it hurt financially that maybe other districts, other, other school administrators across the region wake up and say, this is a risk we can't take. Then thus exert the pressure on lawmakers. That's exactly, but that's exactly right. Parkland, I understand, paid uh, about 122 or 130 million dollars uh, in damages. Uh, in case you don't know, within the last several weeks, as a result of the slaughter that occurred in that Florida high school, um, the idea that it it the idea of these lawsuits, because the only thing that I can make them. That's, that's what I interpreted it as, Stella. I interpreted it as that as well, which kind of surprised me uh, that he was saying that. Is it? I don't know. See, now we're all kind of confused. I don't know, man. I don't know exactly. <laughs> I thought he was uh, dismissing it. It's kind of what, I, what I, I took it as. Like he said, it was like nonsensical. I thought that's what he said. Thirty-one thirty. We might have to rewind back after thirty-one minutes. Them hurt is in their pocketbook, is to make them pay money. Now, see their response to that has been traditionally, "We'll show you. We'll prevent you oh. from having to." Okay, Pepper said, "No, you're saying you ain't got your priorities right." Probably. Okay, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, GG. Say so he's bashing parents for complaining about CRT, not Oxford. Ah. True, 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 true. Okay, that makes sense. To make us pay money, we'll prevent you not be, by winning in court, but by fixing the laws so that we're what they call immune from lawsuits. So you can't even bring a lawsuit against us. So we can bring motions in front of the court and get you kicked out of court before you even get your case heard. That's the way they fix the deck in this case. That's why I tell you that the state legislatures, on the one hand, are giving lip service, and then they're going out 
out to dinner with the NRA and all the insurance companies and saying, well, what can we do to fix the deck? Nobody pays attention to the laws we pass. So nobody knows, basically, if you ask 100 people on the street, 99 out of 100 people won't know that the laws in Michigan are fixed. So you virtually can't bring a lawsuit under Michigan law to make it hurt as a result of negligence committed in this fashion, allowing a homicidal student with a gun to walk into school, keep his backpack, let him leave uh, whatever room he was in to commit uh, a slaughter. A lot of people don't, most people don't know that. Now, the next question is, how do you get people off their asses to do so? What did he say? It's kind of like it cut out a little bit. Thing, it's just a fashion allowing a homicidal student with a gun to walk into school keep his backpack let him leave uh, whatever room he was in to commit uh, a slaughter a lot of people don't most people don't know that now the next question is how do you get people off their asses to do something about it how do you get people how do you get people Instead of talking about race theory, critical race theory, you get them off their butts and they go into the, the, the school boards. Why, why isn't there uh, 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 just everybody in mass going to the uh, uh, Oxford uh, school district school boards and saying, turn over the money right now. Turn over your insurance policies right now. Admit liability. Show us all your documents. I have to say, I kind of like the guy. <laughs> I don't know his history. I don't know what the, you know, all this stuff. Maybe there's things I'm not seeing. I like that he's pissing people off. Screw it. Pissing people off. Because I'm tired of the shooting crap, too. It just keeps happening over and over and over. It's the same crap over and over. Hey, go for everybody. Piss everybody off. <laughs> but it's true, though. They are. This is like the new trend. You know what I'm saying? Like the new thing. And people, you know, with the, it seems like, you know, I don't know, the CRT. I never really sat down and, like, really you know, research them. I'm not, just not at that interested. I'm so tired of the crap all the time, every day, every single thing. They're constantly happening. Just tired of the crap. But, um, I mean, it's true though. It is kind of true. They're going harder for that than these kids getting shot and killed. Documents. Right. I don't know. Maybe it's the long-term thing of educating. Maybe they're trying to educate kids. I don't know. Man. Right now. You're talking about what the people can do? Do that. Why do I have to go through the courts to try to make the, the administration at Oxford School District come clean? Why do, wh who gives them the right? If they're a public... Hell no. Hell no, Cam. Hell no. I'm not blind and deaf. Hell no. If they're the taxpayers, who gives them the right to tell the attorney general, we don't want an investigation? And when they talk about a, uh, an independent investigation, what does that mean? Who's the independent? Who, what independent? Like, there, like there's two sides to this? What's, what's independent? Who's the other, what's the other side to this? I don't know. How and do you survive such a... Look. Look. What else? You got a question, sir? I, Thank you. The prosecutor seemed to indicate last weekend that she was still investigating. The sheriff, the sheriff has indicated the same thing. That they're still investigating more charges could be forthcoming against additional people. And it seemed to indicate that she was, in fact, looking at the actions of the school and, and those that were involved in making all of those decisions. Are you saying here today, and certainly reading the lawsuit, that you don't think anything will come of that? Or That's is right. she still working on that? No, no. I saw that very early on where she would not um, uh, agree that she was not investigating. Well, I can tell you in terms of experience, if nothing else, that nothing will come of that. There will be no charges brought against anyone. Isn't that like social studies, though? Isn't that what they, I mean, I don't know what they're doing in, in these days. You know what I'm saying? Back in my day, my daughter's really young, too, so she hasn't gone to like middle school, high school, that stuff. Isn't that social studies? That just they teach you whatever, whatever, blah, blah, and go, I don't know. It just seems so, I mean, maybe some of the weird videos. I don't mean, I don't want to go too deep into it, but some of the weird stuff I've seen, it's just weird, yo. <clears throat> I don't know. Any other individuals that kids. is school officials for gross weirdo shit. 
mm-hmm. negligence or anything like that. Know. If that happened, and I, the prosecutor could prove me wrong, but I don't think I'm going to be proved wrong, then you're going to see some, like this gentleman asked about hurting. That will scare school officials. If you start prosecuting school officials and you start putting people in jail from the school who could have prevented this, that will also cause change. But then they'll start changing the laws. They'll work behind your back on that and they'll make it so you can't charge school officials. They'll say, if we allow school officials to be charged criminally, just like they say if we allow them to have to pay money, that will impede people from wanting to be school officials, which is (laughs) utter and complete nonsense. But that's what will happen in this society because the force, the powers that be are greater than the, the will of the people. The people have become complacent. The people have become just pawns in this in this game um, that the money interests control. And this is about money here. Trust me, this lawsuit now, behind the scenes of all this, is a big insurance company or more insurance companies meeting with the Oxford High School powers that be and saying, what do we do now? What do we do now with Figer's lawsuit? How do we get him kicked out of court? Not instead of, let's be transparent. Let's turn over all the documents. Let's find out what really happened. Let's, if we have to admit, we should have done what Mr. Figer's lawsuit says we should have done. That ain't going to happen. They're going to lawyer up with insurance company lawyers, and they're going to deny, 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 and deny. And then when they get tired of denying, they'll still keep denying why One more question. Why did you include this? Why did you include this? We included everyone because we are not certain who did what. Okay, it, nothing's been forthcoming except what's been provided to you. The prosecutor, I, I have to say, has been more transparent than a lot of other prosecutors who, who, who circle the wagon and protect other school authorities just like they're part of the government insiders. So I have to admit that this prosecutor has done an, a, a good job in, in providing a lot of the information we're not entirely uh, uh, clear about. However, it is clear to us that whether it be school administrators, whether it be teachers, or whether it be counselors, some or all of them were involved with Crumley in terms of the knowledge of what he had written, in terms of the knowledge of what he had drawn, in terms of their absolute knowledge that he presented a danger and that he had no business being in the school. He needed to go. When his parents said, we're not going to take him out, he needed to be taken out. And I'm absolutely certain that any one of those had the ability to call the police liaison to bring him in. I'm absolutely certain. So it's a process of weeding them out. We don't know the the integral ins and outs of who did what, where, when. That's going to come out. But I might add also, I've watched the press conferences of the... Uh, Uh, the administrators at Oxford High School, the superintendent, and that man is is perseverating. That man is obscuring everything. That man hasn't come clean about anything. So he's a public official. He's at, I hope, he feels himself responsible to the Hold on a second. Is that the guy he just mentioned that we were talking about on the article? Uh, The the press conferences of the... uh, Uh, the administrators at Oxford High School, the superintendent, and that man is is perseverating. That man is obscuring everything. That man hasn't come clean about anything. So he's a public official. He's at, I hope, he's, he's he feels himself responsible to the public. Well, he better come right out today and lay it all out there. Who could, 
what would be the re what would possible possible reason could there ever be for the superintendent of Oxford schools not to lay out every single bit of evidence that he has he can't claim the prosecutor told me not to do it the prosecutor can't tell him not to do something the prosecutor can't tell him to hide evidence the prosecutor doesn't control him what possible reason could there be for him not laying out everything and let the chips fly let the chips fall where they're gonna fall what possible reason I'm telling you right now the reason it hasn't happened today is he's being told by his lawyers don't do it if you do it will be liable mr. Figer will get a whole lot of money it will hurt and maybe your job will get lost in this and so that's why he's not doing it so after this you go run to him and you say Figer says give us everything right now today and you give the people of Oxford everything because it doesn't matter if your job or anybody else's job is on the line who are you protecting are you protecting the students are you protecting the parents or are you protecting yourselves from liability okay that Profiteering. Yeah, right. I'm ready for that. That's just nonsense. There's just. It's not a. I don't care. There. Maybe they could have funerals for the next. There's been hundreds. Every day's a funeral in this country. Uh, tell me the day in the last 20 years that the, this, these sort of events haven't happened or about to happen. There's no good day for this. None. And. See, that's exactly, if educators oh. absolutely oh. said that lawsuits to set forth responsibility and to make people responsible is profiteering, that shows you the madness. That's not nobody with any brains. That's these people saying that. That's what these people would say. These are the type of people who would say exactly what you just said. Not rational people who know in our society there's only two ways to get justice. One, the prosecutor brings a criminal case and they're only bringing it against a couple people. And two, civil cases are brought so that there must might be justice and then there's a third kind of people these nuts who say stop people like Figer from profiteering it has nothing to do with profit I wouldn't do this for money if my life depended and I don't need it what I need is justice and answers and I'm one of the people absolutely who can stand in front of you and say I just don't need that money I want to have answers so the people who are saying that aren't I don't believe that. You do need the money, though. Educators, they're friends of these people who are saying it. These are the folks who are saying that sort of nonsense. These are the people who say he's trying to take our guns away. These are the people who say make it easy for the next 20 years to kill hundreds of kids and traumatize hundreds of thousands. It's these people saying it. Thank you. Wow. This guy snapped. He popped off. Holy crap. <laughs> Started a whole war in the chat, too. He did his job. I guess he did his job. I don't know. Uh, thank you for the super chat, Ursula. Thank you, Lisa, so much. Thanks for bringing, us, bringing this to us. Thank you so much for coming and joining. And uh, appreciate that. Chrissy says, this guy is on fire. And I mean both Ikin Mel and Attorney. Thank you, Chrissy. This guy is on fire. That was a good watch. Thank you, BL. Um... Because of time, because of time, uh, shoot, shoot, shoot. what are we going to do? All right, we're going to close this out. Uh, okay, because of time, let me, uh, so we're just going to jump to this uh, and kind of cover this briefly. Uh, I heard about this last night through Discord, and, you know, there was this plane crash that was leaving. I know it's kind of quick jump. Sorry about that. Just boom, but uh, I got to go soon to pick up my daughter uh so there was this plane crash i think it was nine people or eight how many people died everything got wiped from my head and they were leaving from dominican republic they were supposed to come to orlando but shortly after takeoff i think they try to go land and then boom like i guess they crashed they haven't said specifically what exactly happened i've always had like when i was a kid i used to fly all the time like alone and back then that was actually a lot of fun like i used to go to see my father 
and they used to treat me nice, the stewardess. It, I mean, it's probably not like that anymore. Back then, it was really nice. And when I got older, I, I started getting this fear. I think, I don't know if it's just in general people or just, I don't know, but I just had this fear of flying a little bit because I just, I'm the type of person that thinks of all the horrible things that could happen and what would I do? And what would it be like? And I'm looking at the wing and, you know, whatever. <clears throat> and so uh, this kind of stuff is, and it was a private plane. It wasn't like a commercial plane. Uh, and it says here, Puerto Rican music producer Flo La Movie has died along with his wife, son, and six others after the private jet crashed and burst into flames during an emergency crash landing in the Dominican Republic. Uh, Jose Angel Hernandez today was on board the Gulfstream 4 aircraft when it took off from the La, La Isabela International Airport Wednesday, destined for Orlando, Florida, but it encountered problems 15 minutes later and crashed at the nearby Las Americas International Airport. Uh, and he's done music with big artists, you know, um, Bad Bunny, Azuna. I just uh, I thought it was kind of interesting, just saying condolences and prayers, just, you know, young kid. Uh, there's a video too. We could take a look at it, just, you know, of the... I'm going to check real quick too if they've updated as far as what was the cause. And I don't see a reason yet as to why or you know the reason for it was. I guess it's just a reminder, man. Appreciate what you have. Appreciate why you're alive, your family, your friends, all this craziness happening every single damn day. Some pictures of the family. Nice looking family. There was a map here too. I get it's left from here and then it landed here. The, fl the flight plan shows the plane took off from Las Isabela International Airport before circling over Santo Domingo before the, before the crash landing. You never know, man. Even with money, success, whatever, it just, you know. Uh, Hilados Aviation Group, which owned the private jet, was typically worth more than $2 million, said in a statement that the crash will be fully investigated to determine the cause. Uh, the accident causes us great pain and sorrow. We stand in solidarity with the, fa the affected families that along with us are going to, through a difficult time. Kind of skipping through it. Yeah, they said the director of Air Accidents Investigative Commission told Telemundo that it is still too soon to establish a cause of the accident. The National Association of Pilots RD also sent out a statement mourning the loss of the three crew members who perished. A man claiming to be the brother of one of the deceased told reporters at the airport that the plane had faults and they knew about it. So this could be something too. Who knows? I don't know if there's going to be some sort of legal. Legal situation. Made me think a little bit about Kobe too in that helicopter situation. And the kids. You just never know, man. Another picture of um. He regularly shared snaps of his trips on private jets. Pictured eating with his son Jaden, who also died in the crash. That was crazy, man. You know, in those private jets too. I guess it's like you're living the lavish lifestyle. You know, the, the life of money, and I don't really expect anything to go wrong. I guess who does, right?
So the other thing too, which is like I'm squeezing, I'm squeezing. But uh, really quick, I want to I'll end off with this. The last final segue. And wow, we're here two hours, man. Thank you guys so much for joining. After I come back later, I'm going to try to do a timestamp for people that want to just see certain parts of the live stream. I'll do that. But um, you guys remember Aaliyah and the plane crash and all the R. Kelly stuff. She was a great singer, I think. But I saw this thing come out and I don't know because the person that told this story wrote a book. And so, you know, sometimes you wonder about the person writing a book. But uh, I'll try to breeze through this a bit. Um, so this happened September 11th. In the years since, there have been a few explanations for why the plane was ever allowed to off the ground in the first place. Arguments had broken out between Aaliyah, Aaliyah's entourage and the pilot over the plane being overweight, which is what I've always heard, you know, overweight. After the crash, it was quickly confirmed that the small twin engine plane exceeded its maximum weight limit by, by several hundred pounds. Plus, the weight was not evenly distributed, which would have made the plane harder to control once it got in the air. The last significant update came in 2002 when a toxicology report found that the inexperienced pilot had la coca okay, and alcohol in his system. Okay. It never quite added up to the author and acclaimed music journalist Kathy, who would, why Aaliyah would, a known, uh, sorry, why would Aaliyah, a known anxious flyer, be so insistent on getting on the small plane when it was clearly overloaded with baggage, especially when there was a chartered plane set up to pick her up the next day? But Kathy stumbled across what she believes to be the final piece of the puzzle in the process of researching. Uh, and her upcoming book, Baby Girl, out on August 17. You got to put put in the promo, the plug. I guess this is the book. So that's why it's like sometimes, you know, I don't know, book, but still nonetheless interesting. It came from a man in the Abaco Islands named Kingsley Russell, whose family ran a taxi and hospitality business in the area. Shortly after the death of Kobe Bryant in February 2020, Russell made a since deleted YouTube video describing how the helicopter crash was triggering because it reminded him of the day he watched Aaliyah being taken on board the fatal flight while she was asleep, knocked out by a pill that a member of her team had given her. That I never heard before. I never followed the Aaliyah story that closely, but this supposedly is like something new that's being alleged and came out. They gave her pills, they made her pass out. Minutes after she saw the entourage carrying a carrying a sleeping Aaliyah onto the plane despite her previous protests about boarding it. Russell said he remembers hearing the unforgettable sound of the aircraft crashing into the ground. Russell's account with a bomb was a bomb to Kathy, who for years struggled to accept the fact that Aaliyah willingly risked her safety and her teams just to make, make it back to Miami that Saturday night. I remember when Aaliyah passed away, I was really upset. Uh, as the story kept saying that she was adamant about getting on the plane, I was almost upset with her. Why did you want to get on the plane so badly? I remember wrestling with this being like, well, she wanted to get back to Damon Dash. She wanted to be with her team and who wouldn't want their stuff with them. And learning that she did not want to get on the plane for someone like myself and so many others, I think it's closure for us. She adds, it's unfortunate closure, but I needed to hear that she didn't want to get on that plane. I needed to know that the person who I thought had the most common sense in the world uh, had common sense to not get on that plane. The fact that she was so adamant staying in the cab, refusing these things are ref staying in the cab, refusing these things are, these things were never, these things were never new. Sorry, I cannot read. I'm jumbling up everything. I think it's just me trying to rush, which I don't. Really not good to rush when reading. Um, Kathy slid into Russell's YouTube private messages saying she was working on a book about Aaliyah and asked if he'd be willing to chat. Russell told Kathy that he had received a handful of messages but was only interested in speaking to her because Aaliyah had told him during that final journey to the airport if he wanted to do anything, be an author. Feeling he was destined to talk to Kathy, Russell began to sharing his story and that he had long been advised to keep to himself. Russell had been 13 in 2001 and wound up being in Aaliyah's orbit by working as her team's baggage carrier. 
securing the tip job by his aunt, Annie, who was handling the team's transportation and scouting locations for filming. Annie gave testimony in, at the coroner's inquest into Aaliyah's death in 2003, citing concerns of the team having too much video equipment on to take to the plane. Kingsley's mother was Aaliyah's driver during the time on the island, which allowed Russell to chat with her on their way to the airport. Already experiencing a two-hour delay due to the plane's late arrival, Russell claimed that Aaliyah grew even more flustered when she finally saw the small plane and refused to board it. At the time, the pilot was insisting that the plane would be too heavy with eight passengers, including Aaliyah's 300-pound Man, they got to throw the guy under the bridge. 300 pound bodyguard and all their luggage and video equipment. The airport staff and Aaliyah had the common sense that the plane was overweight. Russell quoted in the book, pushing back against her team, Aaliyah climbed into a taxi van complaining of a headache and said that she was going to take a quick nap. Meanwhile, her camp continued to try to convince the pilot to fly them with all their luggage, according to Russell. Eventually, Russell said, a member of Aaliyah's team came back to check on her and the singer had reiterated that she did not want to get on the tiny plane and that she had a headache. It was then Russell claimed that the team member produced a pill which Aaliyah took and fell into a deep sleep which she remained in when the pilot finally agreed to fly the group back to Florida. Florida. So it's Florida, right? Everything comes back to Florida. They took her out of the van and she didn't even know she was getting boarded on the plane. She went on the airplane asleep. <clears throat> When Aaliyah's body was recovered nearly 20 feet away from the wreckage, she was still strapped into her seat, slumped to the left with her 5 foot 7 inch frame folded over, according to the book, and an autopsy report concluded that her, several, that her survival was unthinkable, citing her extensive burns and major head trauma. <clears throat> so that's the new claims. So that's the new claims. Uh, supposedly they gave her a pill. I don't know if she willingly took this or not. The other thing too, really quickly, the reason I'm rushing is because I got to roll out of here. Got to go pick up my daughter. The other thing too, and I guess I planned too much for this live stream. Uh, one little thing from this article that I was kind of reading. Okay. Just one little, I don't know, weird quirk in an interview with German media, just one month before the fatal wreck. Aaliyah shared a now eerie anecdote about a reoccurring dream she had been having at the time. The pop sensation, one of the most coveted performers of her era, told the interviewer that in the dream, she was being followed by someone which made her feel scared and anxious, but then suddenly she would fly away and feel at peace. It's a, it, is the dark in my, it is dark in my favorite dream, she began. Someone is following me. I don't know why I'm scared and then I'm finally... Then I'm suddenly lift off far away. How do I feel as if I'm swimming in the air? Free, weightless, nobody can reach me, nobody can touch me. It's a wonderful thing. So that was just one of the kind of the weird, I guess, eerie. This was one month before she died. She was having these dreams of being chased, flying away, feeling light, lifting up. I don't know. So for anybody that's into Aaliyah or the old school stuff, you know, just a little flashback to that. Oh, but yeah, uh, thank you guys so much, man, for coming through this afternoon. I didn't expect a two hour stream and I didn't expect the extra 40 minutes of content. I think that's what it was. The lawyer video, which was great to see. I thought it was interesting. Um, and I'll leave the other stories for another time. I had some other stuff, but I should, I should stop it. Can <laughs> I mean, I don't know. This stuff is just. This did happen today, though. Rock the boat. Mm. Naked Florida man steals pickup truck from dealership. Leaves police and authority chase. This happened today. I, I don't know. December 16. Yeah. is it... Typical Florida story. Out. I'll just end up on this. Alright, still westbound Longbow. He's uh, passing back through Lance. He's continuing on Longbow. Uh, 
right, here we go. 3681 Longbow. 3681 Longbow. He just pulled in the driveway. I got him. Unmarked. Damn. All right, they're dressing. One's got him at gunpoint. How's he doing? No, we got him prone down in the yard. Thirty-six eighty-one longbow. Okay. That happened over there too, Los Angeles. You guys had a naked guy too. He was naked. Yeah, this was, uh, let's see where this was at, specifically Melbourne Police, Richard Blows, there he is right there, oh lord. Police department said surveillance video show Blows, it's not Blows, it's Blois, Icked Mel, <laughs> at the dealership just before 5 a.m. wearing only underwear, walking around the business, getting into another car and getting in and getting on its roof for 30 minutes before stealing the ramp. Ah. At least nobody's hurt. <laughs> the jokes write themselves with this story. California used to be the hotbed for crazy. You guys kind of still are. I don't know. It, it is debatable. Insane news, but Florida has certainly surpassed making it the number one for late night comedy hosts to their to target their jokes. Oh my god. Anyway, bros. Yeah, thank you so much. Love you guys. Appreciate it. Please hit the like, subscribe, turn the bell notifications. I will see. I don't know if I have another video coming out today or not. I probably won't have time because I'll have my daughter, but we'll see. If there's something short, I'll come out. Please hit the like button. I said that already. Uh, yeah, and that's it. I'll try to do a little timestamp later. Check out the Oakley Carlson video if you haven't. Check out the Heidi Plank video live stream that I did yesterday. It was good, informative. Uh, and also... If you're not going to lose your mind, you can check out last night's stream. It's still up, surprisingly. And it, that was like three hours, but it was kind of a, a roller coaster and interesting. So take care of yourselves. Peace.